So we've looked at how we can use IP to send data from one computer to another, but uh, there's a limitation to how much data we can send at one time. So remember the, the IP packet has to fit inside a data link frame. So an ethernet frame or PPP frame or something is usually limited to carrying at most like 1500 bytes or so of, of payload. So if we want to send a file that's larger than 1500 bytes, an obvious solution uh, would be to, to split that data up into multiple packets. Uh, but there are, there are a couple challenges to doing that. So the, the first is that it's always possible for a packet uh, to get dropped somewhere along the way. So we've got packet loss. And this could happen because of some, some physical layer or framing issue where you know, bits are being in interpreted incorrectly or there's some corruption on the line. It could also happen occasionally because of routing protocol changes while, while a router is, is updating its routing table. But if we lose one packet from our stream for any reason like this, then the rest of the packets that we do receive might, might, not, might not actually be that useful. Um, so we want to be able to recover from this to sort of detect uh, loss and, and uh, retransmit or retransmit uh, any, any packets that we've lost. Second, it's also possible for, for packets to arrive in a different order uh, than, than they were sent. So we could have reordering of packets. And that can happen, for example, if um, packets are arriving at Denver here, um, destined for host B over here, and, and Denver might have uh, two routes. It might send some of the packets this way, and it might send some of them this way. And when they arrive in New York, they could uh, end up getting interleaved into a different order than they were when they, when they were sent. And so host B over here would have to be able to handle that reordering and, and put them back in the correct uh, sequence. Also, there might be many conversations going on between uh, two computers. So we need some way of knowing that when computer B over here um, receives a packet from computer A, you know, which conversation do, does it go with? So we've got multiple conversations. And so for example, if, if B is transferring uh, two different files from A at the same time, um, how do we know which packets are, are part of, of which files? And then finally, if we have a lot of packets that we're sending between these two computers, it might matter how fast we send them. So for example, if computer A over here is sending packets as fast as it can, you know, what happens if this link between San Francisco and Denver is operating at a lower bit rate? Or, or what happens if there's also packets coming from Seattle headed this direction? You know, what could happen is that this link could become congested and then the San Francisco router is going to end up dropping some packets. So it'd be nice to have some sort of, some sort of flow control here. So flow control. that can tell A to, to slow down if, if there's too many packets being dropped. And so in this video, I want to talk about TCP, which is the transmission control protocol, which, which actually solves all of these problems for us. And so it does that by, by providing what's called a byte stream service. Which is connection oriented. connection-oriented, and reliable. And I'll explain what all this is in just a minute here. And so by connection-oriented, what I mean is that before sending any actual data, host A has to establish a TCP connection, a transmission control protocol, a TCP connection to host B. So this is sort of like a, a, like a phone call where, you know, before anyone can talk, you've got to dial the number, wait for the other person to answer and, and say hello, and then you can start the conversation. And so there's a, there's a connection setup process that takes place first. And when we say byte stream service, what that means is that once that connection is established, either side can then just send a stream of bytes without having to think about how they're broken up in, into individual packets. So, you know, one end over here can just put a stream of bytes into TCP, and then the same identical stream of bytes is going to just appear at the other end. And so it doesn't matter how long that stream of bytes is because TCP is, is going to automatically break that up into smaller segments, each of which fits into an IP packet. And so then when TCP receives data at the other end of the connection here, it's going to send an acknowledgement back. And that way, if the acknowledgement isn't received after some you know, time interval, then the data can be retransmitted. And that's one of the, the ways that TCP provides reliability. So it also keeps track of the, the correct sequence of each segment that it sends, um, so it can put data back in order when it receives it and remove any, any duplicate packets that, that show up, uh, just to, to ensure that it's providing that reliable connection um, and providing that byte stream service between both ends. And so now I just want to take a closer look at the actual format of the TCP uh, packet. 
So the TCP data is going to be encapsulated inside an IP packet, which is going to be encapsulated inside some kind of layer 2 frame. Um, so again, if we have an Ethernet frame here, the, the payload, the ether type is going to be 0800 because we're, we're encapsulating IP inside Ethernet. And so then this payload is going to include the IP and the TCP data. And so if we take a closer look at what we've got here, the IP header we've looked at before, so that's going to have our source and destination IP addresses. So that's how the routers are going to know how to route this, this packet. Um, and then it also has the protocol. And if we're using TCP, this protocol is going to be set to 6, because 6 is the protocol number for TCP. So anytime you see a 6 in the protocol field of the IP header, then we know that we're dealing with, with a TCP packet. And so then if we come down and look at the TCP header, uh, a couple fields that I want to point out is the source and destination ports. These two fields here, uh, these are used to uniquely identify the particular connection that's uh, taking place. So remember, we've got two computers. So we've got host A and host B over here. So if this is A and this is B, you're going to have, if A is sending a uh, TCP packet to B, you're going to have A's address as the source address, and you're going to have B here as the destination address. But then you're also going to have a source port and a destination port, because A might have two connections to B. And in order to tell those two connections apart, you're going to use these ports. And so, for example, one of these connections might be port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on host A, and maybe port 80 on host B. And then maybe another connection, a different connection, might be port 6, 7, 8, 9 going to port 80 again on host B. And it's okay that this is the same port over here because each connection is uniquely identified by the source address, the destination address, the source port, and the destination port. So if all of those things are the same, then we're talking about the same connection. And these connections are also bidirectional. So, for example, host B can send data back to host A. And in that case, it would just flip all of these things. And so in that case, the source address would be B, the destination would be A, the source port would be 80, and the destination port would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so these connections are all bidirectional. The next thing that I'll point out in the TCP header is this checksum field. And this checksum field works the same way as like the frame check sequence field that we saw back with Ethernet or HDLC. But the difference is that it just provides a checksum for the TCP header and all of the data in, in the TCP stream. And so even though we have the frame check sequence happening at the data link layer, TCP still provides its own checksum because uh, the goal of TCP is to provide a reliable service. And so this is just kind of a, an extra check that's being done. And then the next two fields that I'll talk about are the sequence number and the acknowledgement number. And so the sequence number is uh, initialized to some value at the beginning of the connection. And then for every byte that is sent, the sequence number is increased. And that way the receiver can use these sequence numbers to know what order to put the data back into if, if packets get out of order, or it can detect if, uh, if there's data missing, or it can detect if there's duplicate packets that arrived that it needs to, to remove. And then after receiving some data, a host will send an acknowledgment and use this acknowledgment number field to respond with the next sequence number that it expects. So in the next video, I'll walk through the flow of setting up a connection and sending some data to hopefully give you a better idea of how this all works.